Thank you. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Eric Dorland. Um, I am the, among other things, the automake maintainer. Um, the level's okay? Um, and I'm gonna talk, maybe not. <laughs> Is that better? Is mine muted? No. No, it's green. All right. Um, right, so I'm the automated container, uh, among other things. Uh, and today I'm gonna talk about uh, removing obsolete packages. Uh, this is meant to be a boff. Uh, I only have 16 slides. So um, I'm going to talk about my experiences in removing old versions of Automake. And please feel free to interrupt with questions or criticisms or um, comments uh, as we go. But uh, hopefully we'll have a bit of discussion about how to do this better in the future or, uh, or maybe not better. We'll see. Um, so just to set the context a little bit. Uh, Automake in Debian. Uh, I started maintaining it a really long time ago. <laughs> it's making me feel old. 2002. Um, this was around the time that Automake 1.6 came out, I think. Um, so one of the problems Automake has is that new releases of it are usually have incompatibilities with aren't backwards compatible completely. Um, there's various reasons why this is doesn't it provides a very weird interface because you're basically embedding things inside of make files and it's hard to control the API of a make file. Um, back in the day, uh, there was for a very long time there was Automake 1.4 and that just sort of worked and then uh, Automake 1.5 was introduced. Debian upgraded to Automake 1.5 and lots of packages broke. Uh, so what ended up happening is that Automake 1.5 got moved into its own package, and Automake 1.4 uh, was the Automake package. Um, nowadays, the older versions get moved into their own packages, and the generally the currently released version, or the, the most up-to-date version, is the Automake package. Um, this has some downsides because it's not necessarily fully backwards compatible, um, but this is usually what people want. They want the latest version of Automake and they don't want to have to install a new package anytime a new version of Automake comes out. Um, all of the Automake packages uh, provide an alternative so that you can have your user bin Automake be exactly which Automake you want it to be. Uh, the priority of that alternative usually means that the latest version of Automake is the one automatic selected, but of course you can override that. And um, just a little note here that depending on Automake directly is like a little risky because again, if you have fancy Automake files, new versions of Automake might break you potentially. Uh, but anyway, this is not the Automake buff. This is just a little context about why Automake is what it is in Debian. Um, so there's problems with this. Because of these backwards of Kevin issues, as I said, we're packaging all the versions of Automake. Each new version is getting a new package, basically. And we've gone through a lot of Automake packages over the years. Um, I didn't count them up, but it looks like almost getting close to 10, I guess, um, which is a lot of packages to have to deal with. And so people will depend on these individual packages for whatever reason. And then getting them out of the system uh, when they become old is troublesome. Um, as, of, as of the Wheezy release, we had four different automakes in the Wheezy release. So we had one, the old, old, as you can see, 1.4, 1.9, 1.10, and 1.11. Um, in SID, at one point, we were going to have five different versions of automake, which is a lot of versions of automake. And you can also see that the 1.4 version was last released in 2002 when I started maintaining this stuff. So it's really old. And no one should be using it, and no one should have been using it for the last 10 years. Um, but we sort of kept it around because people were like, oh, maybe there's old software that you know still depends on how to make 1.4. Um, yeah. 
Not great. So this is crazy, right? This is it's too many versions of automake. No one really wants them. Um, so I started out on this mission to bring us down to hopefully one or two versions of automake for the next release. Um, and so I've been doing this over the last year. And um, I was making these slides and I was thinking about this sort of had these weird parallels with some things I'd read about. Um, so now I present you the five stages of removing an obsolete package from Debian. The first stage is denial. All right. So if I send mail to Debian Devel asking everyone to very nicely move off of these old versions of Automake, they'll just do it, right? I mean, does everyone agree that, that, that that's what will happen? <laughs> yeah. So. So that's what I started out by doing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools and stuff that I went through this process. So, if you, so this is sort of technical and sort of procedural. If you've got questions about either side, just shoot up your hand. Um, so the first thing you do, or well, the first thing I did, is that I used grefd control to figure out which packages were build depending on automake. So automake basically has no actual binary dependencies. It's all build dependencies. Um, so there were 169 packages, source packages. Okay, that's, you know, that's a lot, but in Debian scale, it's not that much. It should be fine, right? Um, then I used uh, the ddList tool to turn that list of packages into a list of maintainers with their packages. It's a very nice tool for just generating these emails. Then I sent out an email to Debian Devel saying, here's my plan. I want to get rid of these old versions of Automake. Um, here are the packages that are built depending on them. You know, please do your part and fix this. And I sent that out, that mail out on May 27th, 2013. So before the last StepConf, which I was not at. Um, stage two, anger. So uh, people aren't fixing these things. I'm going to have to actually do something other than send an email. All right, fine. So uh, the next thing I did was um, to try to encourage people again to sort of make this move. Uh, Lintian has this really nice facility. One of the tests is actually there's a list of obsolete packages. So you, if you put your package in that list, Lintian will complain anytime anyone depends on you, that package to try to like force maintainers that are paying attention that they shouldn't actually be depending on these packages. So that's good. And that's, it's cheap to do. Just send a patch to, Lint to Lintian. I don't see any reason they wouldn't take it if it made sense. And then, um, and now I have to file bugs. Because you know people don't read Debian Devel. It's sort of it's fair, I guess. Um, so I basically just went through the list of packages I had with a simple substitution script, sent out mail that was like, "Please stop depending on Automake." Blah, with a very boilerplate thing saying, "This is why we're getting rid of these old versions of Automake." And uh, I sent that off to BTS, which is really easy, right? Because BTS is just email, so you can just do that. You can file a bunch of bugs that way. Uh, I should note that my initial email was a proposal for this mass bug filing as well, um, which you're supposed to do as part of the procedure of sending out mass bug filings. Um, so when I did this, I had to file 117 bugs. So if there was 52 packages that got fixed between me sending my initial email and the bugs. So that's, I mean, that's good. I shouldn't be that angry, maybe. I did wait four months between these two events, though. Uh, so there's plenty of time. Um, and then the other thing I used was, of course, using BTS user tags to track all these bugs very easily by adding this auto make cleanup 2013 tag. Um, I added the date because I knew this would not be the last auto make cleanup that I would have to do. Uh, <laughs> so I keep these separate. Uh, you know, always good to date your work if you think you might have to repeat it. And you'll finish in 2013. Yeah, no, I did not finish in 2013. I started it in 2013. I should have like been automate cleanup 2015 or something if I wanted the finish date. Um, all right, so stage three, bargaining. Okay, so I'm past the anger stage, and now I'm like, okay, I've filed all these bugs, but not much is happening. So let me just fix this for you. I'll I'll, I'll give you the exact fix on how to like move to the newer version of Automake. Here's the patch. Just apply it and upload your package. It's you know I've done all the work. I've done all the hard stuff. Um, so before I even did this, 34 packages were fixed without supplying a patch. All right? I began the patching in late October. 
and of 2013. And um, this is the hard part. This is the part that's tough to automate. In many cases, just switching to the newer version of Automate worked, and then it was easy. But that was maybe 50% of the cases. I, don't, I didn't keep good statistics about how, mm, how tough this was exactly. But um, in a lot of cases, like you ha I had to fiddle with the build system, or I had to like, I it, like a lot of build a lot of build rules would like um, run auto make itself, like instead of using dh re uh, auto reconf, and um, so there was a lot of actual like fiddling with packages, trying to get them to build, and then like just waiting to build these things, which can take a very long time um, to test that this worked. So this was like a lot of actual tough work. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, so I mean, the, I used, of course, pbuilder to do the builds. And then if I, caught, if I successfully built something with the new version of Automake, I would just mail off a patch to the existing bug in the BTS and, say, here's, and flip the patch tag saying, here's the patch. So I thought, okay, at this point, you know, there's patches out there for almost all these problems. Uh, there should be a wave of uploads and everything should be great. Okay, so stage four, depression. It's not what happened. All right, I was pretty much on my own. The, the responsible maintainers have already fixed this problem. So we're into this sort of long tail of um, people who don't care or people who are too busy to fix, to, to deal with their packages or do anything here. So now I have to upload M, uh, an Amuse. So I started this in late January, I think. And between January and April, I had to upload 63 NMUs. So it's again about maybe 50% of the, f the remainder got fixed in the last stage. But 63 NMUs is a lot. Um, so again, I, I uploaded these to delayed 10. So only seven of these were actually like another upload came in in front of them to block them out or anything like that. Um, it was relatively easy. This part was sort of fairly mechanical. I just applied my patch that I'd already created in the BTS, and then uh, using the dev change tool, which is really nice, you can just have it create the the change log entry for you. And then again, you use pbuilder to build the package. Um, it's really nice if you use, I, this might be obvious too, but if you use something like a new PG agent, you can save yourself a lot of typing of your password while you're signing packages for upload. Um, and then you upload it to delayed 10, and you use the nfmu diff tool to update the bug. The nfmu diff tool is really awesome. Uh, you basically just give it the, the existing package and your upload, and it will do all the magic of creating the, figuring out what the patch is, sending it to the BTS uh, with an nice email saying, I've uploaded this. So that's, uh, uh, for doing nmu's, you should be using this. If you're not, you're doing it wrong, I think. Um, so there's a bunch of these uploads, and uh, mostly people were happy with them. But uh, I did get one response that was like, why are you doing this? So this is a little redaction of the, so this was the, the quoting of the email that got sent to me. It's like, I've prepared an MU for a package, and I've uploaded to delay 10. And so I got this, NMUing for a wishlist bug. Ah, oh, question mark, question mark, question mark. There's a lot of question marks. We had, must have had a lot of questions. And then uh, this is, again, part of the boilerplate that NMU diff sends out. Please feel, feel free to tell me if I should delay it any longer. Yes, please, indefinitely. Uh, or at least until it's important, uh, slash RC. Um, so I went out who, there was only one person who sent me a note, a note like this. Many people sent me thanks uh, and appreciation. But, um, and this didn't really impede me because they, in fact, uploaded a, a package that fixed this about three or four days later. Uh, but the reaction was kind of weird. Um, so I don't know, does anyone have any opinion? I guess I should ask the question. Does anyone have an opinion if this is wrong to NMU, a wishlist bug? It seems really situational. If you filed a wish list bug and there's been no activity for a while, or if in general there's no activity on the package for a while, then I don't see any reason why you couldn't upload a delayed one, given that it can always be removed within 10 days. Mm -hmm. Uploading immediately for a wish list bug seems almost always a bad idea. 
but a delayed upload for a package that doesn't seem to be getting uploads every other day from its maintainer, I don't think it's reasonable to gripe about that. That'd be great. There's rest there. I have, an oh, opinion. I'm sorry. I have an opinion that it's not a wish list bug. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, I, I think that, you know, if you're trying to get rid of old packages, then I think that it starts out as wish list, fine. But when you're down to the last few maintainers who have not uploaded their package, I think at that point you're climbing towards normal or important. And at some point the package is going away, at which point it's RC, and then NMUs are, of course, perfectly fine. Sure, there, there, there's a bit of a catch-22 here in that, um, that I guess I'll talk about in the next slide, but it's hard to get FTP master to remove the package before all of the dependents have been changed. So you, it's actually tough to get it upgraded to RC. I mean, it, that's possible. That's a possible solution, but yeah. The way to get it upgraded to RC is to talk to the release team who, will, who have the jurisdiction over what is RC or not. And, we sure. will, and in this situation, probably, we would at this point say, well, you're going to remove the old package. That will stop things being buildable. This is now RC. And then you have some levers to do it. That only applies to this situation, and it's not a I'm not saying that's what we would have done, but right, right. But, the, but but talk to us if you're getting into this. Sure, and I, I suppose I could have tried to petition to have this be a release goal that there were less auto makes in. No. Uh, no. For completely different reasons, that's really complicated, and I no longer <laughs> recommend it. <laughs> now I'm glad that you anonymized this, but. I could probably guess in three exactly who that was. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. Please, please do not speculate on who this was. There's someone back there. I, I mean, uh, what is it? You shouldn't upload for a wishlet bug straight away, and you shouldn't even upload to delay 10 for a wishlet bug straight away. I thought that the delay was specifically introduced such that you can upload packages straight away, and they have a time deadline on them set, such that you have 10 days to respond or to remove the package from the delay yourself. If, yeah. you're, if you're a maintainer and you're not happy, you should know how to use decut remove, right? Sure, yeah. I and, and, and now we're saying that, well, actually, you should file a bug and say that you're intending to upload it to delay 10, and then sometime later you should come back and do that, actually. I think, should we create delay 30? Right. Or? So my, my, <laughs> reading, my reading of the handbook about NMUs also seems to jive with this, where it's like, if this is, a, if this is an actual bug, the severity doesn't matter. You can, delay, you can basically upload an NMU to delay 10 at any time. Is what I read. For, is that is my interpretation of the, of what it says there? Now, maybe other people disagree about that interpretation, I, but I, I totally agree with that. And yeah. and I'll point out that this is after you had filed the bug. Yeah, this is like and three after months you had later. Sent the patch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if if the patch has been available and hasn't been applied, and new versions haven't been uploaded, then uploading it to delayed ten, there is absolutely no reason to avoid doing that. This sure. is absolutely. I mean, you were you were gracious. <laughs> your delay of sending it to delayed, and then you were gracious into making it delayed ten by that point. So right. Yeah. I mean, so I, I did. I did perhaps. I guess one of the questions too that I, that I will come up at the end, last slide too. But is should um, should I have waited? Should I have done the patch? Like I basically did this in two stages. I did the patch, and then I waited a bunch of time, and then I did delay ten up NMU uploads for people who didn't respond. So should I have just combined those and just immediately uploaded and used delay 10? Is that is there a consensus around that? If delay 10 isn't enough delay, we could make the number bigger. But in principle, delayed exists so that you can do this in one pass. Upload the file the bug, include the patch, upload the package. If somebody doesn't want it, they know how to delete things from delayed. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it, the yeah. one caveat there being, is it trivially easy for people, for example, who have their packages sponsored to kill something out of delayed without going and finding a sponsor's answer within 10 days? But that aside, you could probably find someone on Debian Devel. Right. If, if you're a sponsor, I think you're responsible for the NMUs you're uploading. Yeah, also true. Uh, other way around, I, was, uh, no, I, I mean, if you uploaded something to the delayed queue. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, yes. well, I thought you were right as well. I mean, I would have, I would have, if there was a delayed 30, like I could have uploaded it there, and that would have been, I would have been fine with that, and it would have gone faster, even though it was delayed 30, probably. I mean, the person who made the upload to delayed, if 
somebody asks you to remove it, you have the powers to remove it, right? Yeah. Such that if the maintainer is uh, non-uploading the D and then uh, he requests you to remove it or she, then you just remove it because you uploaded it. So I don't think there is a deadlock in there. Yeah, and I, I mean, if people were responsive on the bug, I, I didn't immediately NMU things. Like, if people were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get to that in a few, like, I, I, uh, the Grub maintainer um, uh, had, a, had a bug in this, and he was like, oh, I've got that fixed upstream. I'm going to upload it in the next few weeks. And I was like, cool, I'll, I'll ignore it. And then I ignored it for several months, and he still hadn't uploaded it. And I did end up NMU and Grub, and then he was like, whoops! And then he just went over top of that because he had completely forgotten to do this. So, I mean, there's weird situations like that where Everyone has good intentions, and still there can be introduced delays. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, Ganif on IRC wanted to say that the FTP team does, in fact, remove packages when you're down to a few, uh, just a few packages that depend on it. They wouldn't want to remove them if there's 150 of them. Sure. But wanted to, did, did want to mention that that is an option, and they are willing to do that. Uh, that's good to hear. It didn't quite play out that way, but <laughs> it's good to hear. Um, all right, does anyone else before I go into the, next, the last, the final stage? Okay, so the fifth stage, of course, is acceptance. Um, in the end, to get these packages removed, I, I had to sort of appeal to FTP master, like it didn't, all this work, um, they still had to remove that, they still had to do that final step, and it was kind of out of my hands. Um, so eventually, automate 1.4 and 1, and 1 10 are gone, uh, Automate 1.9 is still in the archive. <laughs> there's only three packages that, uh, I think there's one package that still does build depend on uh, Automate 1.4, but it does not build from source either. Uh, but there are three that depend on 1.9 that, 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 uh, that fail to build from source, so I can't really fix them. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I actually, I, I, <laughs> I ran to Paul Tag on the flight here, so he said he would look into it. So hopefully he will. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, so repeated pings on the bug hasn't really produced uh, a removal, uh, even though the bug's been filed for several months now. Um, but again, I mean, FTP Master's busy. This isn't like the biggest deal. I'm hoping to get this out of here before the end of the, well, before the freeze, but um, yeah. So these are the, my last slides. So the open questions, which I think we kind of answered uh, we maybe answered the first one. What, what tools did I miss? What, what could I have done to automate this process better? Um, I mean, in terms of, I mean, some of the slowness was introduced purely from me, just kind of working out tooling on this a few packages at a time in the evening. Uh, but what sort of tools would I, did I miss that could have made this easier? Mike, Mike Runner. As far as uh, tools are concerned, I mean, the, the tool that Jonathan's using here, we, we can still use in a dry run mode, which is to ask DAC, if I remove this package, what else is affected? Because that yeah. goes right the way up the chain. The, the build depends, it's hard to get the recursiveness all the way up, up so that you've got the, the, um, the, the full chain up to a leaf package at the top end. So if you could actually run it, uh, it's on, uh, what's the, which service is uh, it on now? I uh, whichever the developer copy of the archive is on, I can't remember. Okay, I, so that's that's a good point. I think in this case it wouldn't actually matter because all of the things that were left were crappy leaf packages that no one cares about. Uh, so it, like removing them, and in fact they were all already moved. They're all already moved from testing, as far as I know, and won't be in the next release. So it's sort of mute, moot. But um, but yeah, no, it's a good point that if you're if you're trying to figure out how, what the impact is of removing it, uh, using that would be a good idea. But I guess I'm kind of looking more for how do we automate, like, this took me a year. It took me over a year of like wall time, even though it certainly didn't take me a year of engineering time, but it took me a long, long time to get through all of this sort of procedure. What, is there any tools that would make this easier? Like it would have been really, like it would have been really interesting if there was a way to just say, um, here's a list of packages, flip out the build dependency, go build them somewhere, and if they succeed, then I want to upload those as an Muse, right? Like that would have made that would have cut in that would have cut down a lot of the manual labor part of this. Um, even though it would have made the long, there's still the long tail of things that actually required patches, but probably like 50% of the things that were left were just 
me going in, replacing AutoMake whatever with AutoMake the newest, and building it, and then waiting around as my slow desktop machine built this thing. That works well with um, build dependencies like AutoMake and things like that, but there's still other cases where you want to get rid of obsolete packages. Um, yeah. Um, in the early stages, when you're actually doing the identification of the packages, yeah. in some cases, isn't it helpful to just pick out the ones that have no package in testing and just say, well, these these are going to become, they're obviously not being looked after, they've probably got RC bugs already, and get them out early. We, 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 yeah, maybe. I mean, do we consider that a package that has been waiting to go into testing for more than six months is by definition obsolete? And get, and get them like removed from the archive more, or I mean, what's the, or marked somehow as being bad? It's not. I don't think you can blanket that. You'd have to take it on a case by case, but it's certainly a telltale clue that you should be looking at other factors on the package that might also give you a big picture of this package is to go away. Yeah, so it gives you the opportunity at the stage where you're um, preparing the DD list and that sort of thing yeah. to, um, to, to pick out those packages and be more aggressive with them early on um, and escalate right up for, for those packages early and then you can get the whole cycle done much more quickly rather than waiting mm -hmm. so if you actually go through which packages were involved here yeah i would be I mean, it's a fair bet that the packages that were left at the tail were um orphaned not in testing yeah um rc buggy or competition ball three yeah Uh, hi. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm surprised actually you haven't pronounced the term transition, because this is actually what it is, and the release team has uh, nice tools to handle transitions. Okay. Like what? Um, like you can have a, a dashboard of every affected package, uh, which will happen that in like the PTS or the new tracker uh, package tracker, you will have every there will be a line that says, "Hey, this package is part of a transition. You need to do something about it." Hmm. And also, I believe that now we have that we have uh, auto removal from testing. Then, well, yeah, we remove the old packages from testing, which means that the the, the packages will get removed from testing so until they are fixed, which yeah. is the right thing to do. If you do not want uh, the old packages to be released with the new Debian version. So, I mean, definitely the, a bunch of these tail packages were removed from testing. They were all like. The, the, the three that I mentioned are all failed to build from source. They're all removed from testing. But it's not clear to me how to connect those two things up with the actual, like, f forcing the removal to happen, right? Like, how do I make it, in, how do I indicate that we shouldn't care about these packages and that it's safe now to remove AutoMake version X? Sorry? No, I did. I d absolutely did that. I filed it ages ago. And I've pinged it several times with exactly these facts. <laughs> but there hasn't been a lot of motion on, uh, on the, were, none of them got rectified particularly quickly. And obviously there's one that's still sort of dangling. Go ahead, Russ. The, the statement in the audience was just that you should add that, you should add that information to the RM bug. A um, couple of things. One, um, Ganoff says that he just killed AutoMake 1.9, so you should upgrade <laughs> the remaining bugs to RC. <laughs> Thanks, Ganoff. Um, the other one is, is that, uh, the one of the things that I think we could do better at is that you the the whole process of Lintian detecting that the, you're depending on a package that, that goes away. Um, right now, that's a the I think the obsolete file, and I've not been involved in Lintian development very much for the last couple of years. So it's possible that somebody went around and automated this already. But I think that was a, basically a manual uh, is, file that you manual, just add yeah. things to. Um, it seems like this is a place where we could be using sections or something. Like if you uploaded the version of AutoMake that you you want to make go away into a different section or use the or, well, or to be more precise use FTP overrides to move it into a different section uh, Lintian has a bunch of files that it auto generates well semi auto generates in the sense that people run scripts to fill out that data before you upload Lintian each time yeah. um, so that it could just pull down all those files all the, the, that the list of things in whatever that section is that's designated for these packages will be going away and depending on them as a bug which may not be the same as the section we have right now for transition packages because those are not exactly the same problem um, 
and then that would automate some more of that process because then all you would have to do is tag the package somehow or submit an FTP master override uh, bug somehow to say this package is going away and the, then more of that process for the responsive maintainers would happen automatically without you having to babysit it. Yeah. Uh, and on a similar note, there's really no reason why we couldn't automate um, nagging the maintainers who depend on obsolete packages or even mass filing the bugs for maintainers who depend on automated packages ought to do that completely automatically without a human having to do anything except maybe press the button that says, yeah, this looks like a good idea. Yeah, it's an interesting idea to do these, to try to do these more automatically, the, the bug filing. Is there a question over here? Sorry, I didn't hear what you said, though. So if I got it right, the, con the, the idea is to introduce the concept of a deprecated package, which I would appreciate. And the deprecated, like uh, the concept of a deprecated package. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's a great idea, actually. Like we have the old lib section. We yeah. could have the deprecated section. Yeah. And then you upload into the deprecated section, which actually requires manual override by FTP master, but yeah. uh, and then Lintian can automatically say you depend on a deprecated package, yay. Yeah. And you can even say block uploads on that Lintian tag. That's true, that would have been a good, that would be a good thing to do too. Okay, I mean, let's what, implement it. Yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, and that was one of the reasons that I liked putting in the Lintian warning, because it would prevent new people from uh, uploading packages that were depending on these versions of Automake, which you really don't want new problems to show up as you're spending months and months fixing the old problems. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, the thing is, though, Lintian stuff and all the rest, that tends to just work with maintainers who are more or less on the ball. Yeah. And I was wondering if you couldn't just take a big hammer based on Lunar's idea as well. And if you, because if you filed an RC bug against Automake 1.9 itself, then it would, after a week or so, disappear from testing. And all the all his build dependencies would also disappear from testing, and that would, hmm? yeah. The release team might not appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I guess I mean maybe the the question is like, what's the threshold for the, like how how big does the long tail have to be before it's we can just like force it, right? Like if you know. You know, it's, if, if, ten, if this breaks 10 packages and none of them appear to be important, can we just do it? Or do we have to wait? So I think one good example that this provides, not just for Automake, but for a lot of other cases, is that we should really, really hesitate before we start introducing parallel versions of anything into the archive. The default state of anything should be, here is the version for the archive, at which point you start getting fails to build from source bugs because, hey, look, you don't work with the new version. And the default state is not, I get to use the old version and comfortably rest on it. It's, I got to fix my stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's another, that's a little bit, a little bit off topic. I mean, it's very relevant to Automake because I think I'm going to end up with this problem the, the next time uh, there's a new revision of Automake. So the, one of the things that I didn't mention is the, the Automake maintainers have promised uh, to have better versioning in the future so that like actually only major versions should break backwards compatibility, maybe, hopefully. Um, so that's, I mean, that's promising, but uh, yeah, how do, we, how do we make sure that the new version doesn't break huge swaths of the archive before it gets uploaded? Um, I mean, I know there's, there's some people have access to large sort of build uh, like rebuild instances and stuff like that, which would be really useful to hook up with them, but I guess you have to ask them or figure out who those people are, or those sorts of things. As far as the long tail is concerned, um, it does depend on the circumstances, but we have actually done some seriously long tails in one operation. Um, at a BSP, we actually removed 94 packages in a single chain. Oh, wow. Uh, it, so you know, these things are possible. They come. You don't have to think about the tail in 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 those sort of contexts. You just look at the contents of the tail, and it was all of these kinds of packages. Yeah. They were all RC buggy. None of them were in testing. Most of them been waiting for testing for, on average, average six hundred days or more. Mm -hmm. right? um, they might. They weren't orphaned, but. On that basis, they probably should have been. Right. Um, but there wasn't any point offering them. The whole lot just got removed. But is that in the... But that's a transition, right? No. Is that a transition or a removal? No. No, it's just broken. 
<laughs> they, okay. they, they were they had been broken. So maybe my question is is. So was that on the release team side or the FTP master side? Which is also like, where do I submit We happen to have to? both teams on, at the BSP at the time. So. I see, I see. <laughs> I see, I gotcha. Yeah, we do kind of, when we do UK BSPs, we t often tend to have FTP master release team and Neil, who likes to OM things by default. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so trying to getting these two teams in the same room or, physical, or virtual room might expedite these. Yeah, things. absolutely. Right. Okay, That's, well, I mean, it's well, good advice. Do an obsolete sprint. Uh, it's just it's at some point bef before yeah. we get to the, too close to the release, uh, so it's probably a bit late for it now. But yeah. you know, six months or so before the start of the freeze, we organise a sprint, and we get the relevant teams together, and we go through this lot with a, with a fine tooth comb. We just throw things out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good idea. I mean, yeah, just in general to, to. If it's if it's six months or more before the start of the freeze, they've got plenty of time to put it back in if they really care about it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good idea. I mean, it will probably be pretty easy to, to to figure out which packages are. Well, I guess there's a question of what's the difference between obsolete and unmaintained, and like how do we identify what those packages are without it being explicit? It it's really gray. There are all sorts sure. of considerations you have to make, and we we attendees of Cambridge BSPs tend to be a little flippant about this kind of thing. <laughs> 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 and slightly trigger happy, we'll admit. Um, but but it's we we don't automatically go for RM, but we have a we have there's a set of telltale signs that we've picked up are indications that things are not as they should be with a package like uh, the popcorn is uh, it's yeah. and and it's maybe it's got a couple of important bugs and an RC one and maybe somebody is reporting that they are build depping on it and something's going wrong and there hasn't been an upload in six months all those things together combined yeah. say to us this is probably we're better off without it than with it um, and but so, so you have you have to analyze the package as an, as an entire entity, not just say, "Oh, this has two RC bugs. Let's get rid of it." Right. Um, and then you also have to have to make sure that you're behaving nicely to the maintainer of the package in question if they are still around, and and not where are I mean your package by, um, put it back in SID if you like. Um, yeah. But would would something like uh, so? I mean, we've got our removals from testing. But I guess there is no auto removal from SID. There's no auto removal from SID, right. um, and if it gets auto removed from testing, it may get manually removed from SID later on when someone says one of my triggering factors is that this isn't in testing and hasn't been for two releases. Yeah. But it won't happen automatically. That seems um, like a long. That seems like a long period of time. <laughs> it's is an example. Right. Um, I mean, it would, so maybe I'm just I'm just spitballing here, but would it make sense for if something is not propagated, literally nothing has gone into, if it's been removed from testing for a year and no uploads have happened in that time, should we just remove it from SID automatically? Should we have some removal criteria from SID? That's... <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm shying away from saying, yes, we should do it automatically. Um, I think there still should be some oversight because there are corner cases, and that's what I mean about there being uh, grey areas all over the place where you sure. have to look at the situation right now and make a decision, okay. and think that's difficult to do automatically. Yeah. The PTS does have a box at the top that gets bigger and bigger the more problems there are. So if you look at a, if you look at the package page and the box on the PTS is the first page, then clearly you've got a problem. Sure. Um, the, that, like a, that might be a good metric. How many boxes are of warnings out there on the PTS? I'm sure Neil will cook up a script that can <laughs> scrape the PTS yeah. and work out who's got the biggest boxes. Um, okay. But my second point is that um, you, you, we, although we're flippant about it and we are fairly trigger happy, we always make sure that we behave properly and the maintainer gets a chance to explain why there's a problem. FTP masters can look at what's going on and make sure everything's okay. And we don't. There are very few occasions where where it, it's happened, but there are very few occasions where we have filed an RM bug and FTP masters have gone, yeah, okay, and taken it out. In, in the hour, yeah. but it has happened in the right circumstances, and that's what I really want to emphasize. Sure. Rather than auto removal, I think it, it, there does need to be an automated process for the packages in SID. It just needs to be highlighting, and more than just the maintainer, but actually go into a list of people that are actually thinking this, this is like the WNPP report that comes up. Right. You know, it's, it is a it's a package in need of help. Yeah. And it probably it actually needs to be tagged that way. 
You know, we need the automated process that scans through these things. We know what the what the risk criteria are, and we can be fairly general by applying them as an alert on either the bug or the package. Yeah. And saying, look, there are reasonable grounds for doubt about why this package is in this particular state. Yeah. And if that tag then stays on forever and ever, and nobody actually um, manages to clear it, it's just like having it in a deprecated state. Right. Uh, inside the archive, or it's it's a flag that we need to be able to put on packages like this, and then have a tour of the scripts of the entire archive and says, right, there's 600 of these packages. What are we going to do about them? Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Would it not make sense? To, would it not make sense to have some kind of report, say, listing packages by days that haven't been in testing, and number of RC? I mean come up with some rough criteria, put them in an order, put a little text box so people can put notes about the package on it. And that way we could actually deal with these things rather than waiting for someone to run into them. Yeah. <laughs> I was a bit afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, though. I think kind of list like that would be very helpful. Absolutely. Okay, we've got uh, just a couple of minutes left. Is there any, anything else uh, anyone wants to talk about? I think for some for packages that we expect to be removed, it's also been nice if we had some way of communicating that to users of the packages. I mean, there are even cases where there's not necessarily a hundred RC bugs, but just a package is dead upstream, and the maintainer has decided that sooner or later they're going to kill it off. At the moment, we have no very nice way for the maintainers for users of that package to know that or do anything. Enrico, <laughs> can we have a dev tag for either deprecated or obsolete or dead upstream? And then, because anyone can add that to the dev tags, it'll eventually get listed in the apt cache, and people can see it on their own systems if they're interested in the package. It's also very easy to remove. Uh, we can if somebody maintains it. Um, I can add that information in along the way the tags take to get into FTP master, but it's not something you want to be edited from the Debtex Debian Net interface where everyone can do it anonymously, which means somebody needs to kind of maintain it manually, which means it hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's been experimented with the security team in the past to say something like, uh, we don't guarantee security support for this thing, uh, but yeah, um, I would see sections for cases like this uh, because what you want to use this mostly for packages that other things depend on rather than leave packages uh, because leave packages if it's dead upstream. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, 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 yeah, um, so uh, it, it, there's bother age involved in handling <laughs> this. <laughs> and so you, I would focus on bother age to happen where it actually makes a difference in, in some workflow. Uh, it would be nice to tell our users about it, but it would be nice if it were the maintainer that told the user about it. And at that point, the maintainer can just remove the thing from the archive. <laughs> or, yeah. Or, but I, I would still like some annotation on the packages uh, handled by the maintainer. <laughs> Actually, it could be tags in the control file, uh, which is not implemented yet. I'm waiting for adapconf where there is an FTP master to implement it, because I have a prototype. It hasn't happened in the last two years. So we got time for one more. So I think, uh, I think Neil had it, or? I was trying to make yeah. I, the other, I was going to say, for users, though, it would be nice if the maintainer or others in an NMU had some way to communicate, you should really be using this other package instead for those leaf packages, that we don't just remove it and leave the user not with the old thing installed and not knowing what's happened. Yeah. I think we're, I think we're out of time. Uh, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate uh, coming to this talk. And talking through some of these issues. Uh, see, I'll, I'll be at DevConf all week if you want to talk more about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs>